first of all, if you weren't with us for Good Friday, you missed it. We had a wonderful time of worship and fellowship together on Good Friday. And then at the, after that, the food was really great, <laughs> too. We had a nice, it really was. It was, it was, it was, it was just such a blessing to be together, and, and we had a wonderful time of worship and sharing communion together and a time of prayer together. But I, for those of you that were with us for Good Friday, bear with me for just a few as we get into it, because some of what we looked at on Friday, I'm going to start from there. We're going to look at a little bit of that, and then I'm going to keep on going. So some of these verses you've seen already. We talked about them Friday, but we're, we're going to keep going from there. So, so I, I do have a message. I'm not taking Friday night's message and then reworking it for this Sunday morning, but I believe this is where we want to start, uh, we want to start this morning. And so I want to remind us that Christ has made a way for us. When you heard the choir singing this morning, uh, they, they sang, you made a way, didn't they? You made a way. We're going to talk about how Christ has made a way for us this Easter Sunday morning. And I want to remind you, for those of us who are here Friday night, you already know what verse we start with, and it's 1 Peter 3.18. So on this Resurrection su Sunday, um, we look again, sorry, would you, Stephen, would you make sure these are turned off? We never, uh, ushers, we never want these on unless we specifically say so. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. Wrong ones. Just a minute. Thank you. Okay, that's good. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ the Messiah himself suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, the just for the unjust, the innocent for the guilty. And so where we see righteous, just, and innocent, we think of Jesus. And wherever we see unrighteous, unjust, and guilty, we think of ourselves. That's what it was. And it says... He suffered for sins, and that includes his living in this earth, saying no to temptation, choosing always the will of the Father. It wasn't just on the way to the cross. It was his whole life, right? It was his whole life. Yes. Yes to God. Yes to God. Yes to God. If he had not lived a life of saying yes to God, he never could have come to the point of greatest temptation, of greatest battle, and greatest struggle, and said yes to God then. And that's true for us as well. Our foundation of obedience and yes to God is built in, in the hardest struggles. It's built in our lives on all the smaller ones and the lesser ones that we sometimes think it's unimportant. It's not such a big deal. I'll kind of do, I'll do what I want to here, but when I, get into the, when I get into the really serious ones and the really important ones, then I'll say yes to God. Then I'll do what is right. It doesn't work that way. And we see Jesus living a life of yes to God, yes to God, a, co a constant, not my will, but yours be done, a constant battle because he had flesh as we have flesh as well to do the will of the Father. And then as he went to the cross and bore our sins, so he suffered for sins once for all that he might bring us to God. He might bring us to God. Now, remember what we talked about Friday afternoon, this expression that he might bring us to God is a term that is used, it means the same thing as if you are hoping to have an audience with the king. You want to go to the throne room, fr throne room of the king and come before him with a request or with something. But because he's the king, you can't just walk in, can you? You can't just say, well, I'm going to go see the king. We talked about this on Friday evening. You have to have an audience. You have to gain an audience somehow with an earthly king, don't you? Any of you, can you just walk into any earthly king in this, in this world? No, you can't. You can't do it with presidents either. It's the same idea. You have to have, you have to gain an audience in some way. There has to be some way you can get, and not just anybody can. You can't just say, but I want to. We can't just say, but I'd like to. We can't just say, but I have something important to say to him. There has to be something or someone that gives us the audience with the king. And for us as Christians, this is what it means. 
Jesus gives us audience with God. Jesus opens the door for us to come to God. This is exactly, this is literally, this is what this means here. And so we see that what Jesus did and what he went through, it was to bring us to God, to bring us to God. And we'll talk about it at the end, but I want you to think right here at the beginning, go all the way back to Genesis before Jesus came to earth as a man. Go all the way back. Go back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. What would God do in the cool of the evening? He would come down, wouldn't he? What would he do? He would walk with them. He would fellowship with them. He would, there was an intimate, there was a relationship with God. Let me ask you a question. If we think all the way back to the beginning, in the beginning with Adam and Eve, did they have to gain an audience with God in the beginning? Did they have to in some way? No. There was no need to gain an audience with God in the beginning. Why? Because Adam and Eve were in right relationship with God. There was no barrier between. There was nothing that kept them from a holy God because they too were holy. Now that's how it was in the very beginning. And then we know what happened. We know that Adam and Eve at some point chose a way that was not God's way. And they rebelled against God in their choice. And at that moment, at that moment, they lost the audience with God. They lost. It was gone. It was gone. And this helps us to understand why resurrection, why, why the death of Christ and the work of Christ to bring us back to God, to bring us to God, why is it, it, is, it is so important and why it's so meaningful for us. Because Adam and Eve, who had enjoyed such fellowship with God, such love relationship with God, such openness with God, it did not matter if they begged God, oh God, please let us have relationship with you. Let us restore what we have lost because of our sin. They had lost the audience with God and their begging couldn't get it back. They couldn't do all they could. They, they, they couldn't do good deeds. They couldn't try this. They couldn't try that to regain an audience with God. They couldn't promise we'll never sin again because they couldn't keep that promise now. They had fallen. There was nothing they could do to regain the audience with God, the open door with God. So when we come all the way down to the life of Jesus and the time of Jesus, and when we read this in 1 Peter 3.18, it helps us to understand how important it was what Jesus came to do and what he did with his life and with his death, that he might bring us to God. It was the only way to restore what was lost in the very beginning. It was the only way to restore in men and women, in your life and my life, what God has created us for. God has created you for relationship with him this morning, brothers and sisters. We sometimes get it wrong and we think, I must do for God. And yes, God has given us good works to do. But God has first of all designed you even when you and I are broken and fallen in sin, God has designed you for relationship with him. God desires relationship with you and he desires relationship with me. The worst sinner that's walking on the streets of Hong Kong, the homeless person, the person this morning in Hong Kong or in your home country that is lying there drunk, and in his own vomit because of his lifestyle. God desires relationship with that person. Why? Because he is made in God's image and he is God has made men and women for himself, for relationship, brothers and sisters, for relationship. And there could be no relationship with a holy God until Jesus came to make a way. That's why this morning choir, when we sang, you made a way. That's what you were singing. 
That's what it meant. You made a way. There was no other way. There was no other road. That's why the Bible says salvation is found in no other name. There's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. And to be saved means to be brought back in to relationship with God, the God who gives us life. The God who gives us life. Amen. This is res the resurrection story. This is the Easter message. And this is why Jesus came. And it took his life, his perfect life. It took his perfect death. It took his perfect resurrection to make a way for us to come back to the Lord, come back to the Lord, that which we were designed for. And so he suffered for our sins so that he might bring us to God. Every single thing in your life and mine that made a barrier with God, our sins, our willfulness, our selfishness, our own choices, I want to do what I want to do, our bitterness, our unforgiveness, our brokenness. Jesus took all of that from us and put it on himself and carried it to the cross. The heaviest burden he bore was not a wooden cross, upon his back as he climbed that hill. The heaviest burden he bore was everything in your life and my life that kept us from God. He put it on himself and he went to the cross so that he might bring us to God. And that is why the writer to Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know, when God wanted to restore relationship with men and women, he knew it was going to take Jesus. But he loved us even then. He loved broken, sinful men and women all that time in between the fall of Adam and Eve until the time of Jesus. So what was God going to do for all of those men and women, all that time in between. He gave men and women the tabernacle and the old system of the law and the animal sacrifice that could be brought to the tabernacle and an animal that was innocent would be slaughtered. It would be brought a lamb or a goat and other things as well. It would be brought and the priest would take a, 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 there was a special knife that was used for it and would pull, for, would pull forward the throat of the lamb or the goat and would pull it forward and then with a, with a quick slice would, would sever that and the blood would spill out. But they wouldn't, it wasn't just spilled on the ground. They would have a, a special bowl and a cup and they would catch it. And then they would take the blood to the altar and they would splash the blood on the sides of the altar. And it was such a reminder that sin cost something. And then they, would, then they would take, for the sin offering, the body of the lamb was opened in a special way and, and flayed in a special way and then burned. That's what you always did with the sin offering. That, it always, that's, that's what you had to do with the sin offering. And it was a reminder to people, it was a reminder to people that sin is costly. It costs something. Now all those people in between the fall and until the time of Jesus, do you know what? They had no idea how costly sin really was, did they? They thought it was kind of costly because it took money from their pocket, money that they would have used otherwise for themselves and their family. And they had to take money from their pockets or they had to go into their, to their fields and to their sheep and they had to take a lamb that was perfect. It had to be the best lamb that they had or the best goat that they had. It had to be a lamb that at the market would fetch the highest price, the best price. It was, had to be the best. God knew what he was doing. And people didn't understand it, but they did in faith and in obedience what God had said. And to them, they thought, wow, this costs a lot. The sin offering, week, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, the cost of it. And God provided that so that people would have a way to come to God. But do you know what? If you go back and read in the Old Testament, you will find something in the Old Testament as people came to God with their offering. And as the high priest went in once a year, in through the tabernacle, in through the first curtain, 
then in through the second curtain into the holy place, and then in through that final curtain into the holy of holies, once a year on the day of atonement. Atonement, the day of payment, the day of payment for our sins. And if you go back and you'll read, do you know what you will see as you look at people bringing the sin offering and the high priest bringing the offering on behalf of the people? They never, listen, listen, they never approached the throne of God with confidence or boldly. They never did that. There was always the, 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 the thought and the, 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 the burden of, is my, sin, is my sin offering acceptable? Is this lamb, is this goat perfect, really perfect, or is it imperfect? And will it be rejected as an offering for my sin? When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement, you think, oh, but he's the high priest. I'm sure he went in with confidence. I'm sure he went in boldly. No, he didn't. If you read the Old Testament, do you know what it says? It says that as he went in, the high priest wore around his ankle a rope. Do you know why he wore a rope as he went into the Holy of Holies? He wore a rope just in case what he offered to the Lord was not acceptable and the Lord would strike him down in the Holy of Holy Holies and the priest would not dare go into the presence of God himself. They would take the rope they, it, and it was there that if he were struck, they would pull the high priest out. That in no way describes what we read in Hebrews. Does that make sense to us this morning? As we think about how we can approach the Lord Jesus Christ, not flippantly, not arrogantly, not, oh, well, ha, things are different now because it's the new covenant. But for you and for me, not under the guilt of, and the condemnation of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, that I hope my offering is good enough, but under the New Covenant, the New Testament, which is the blood of Jesus Christ, that gives us confidence to approach not the throne of judgment, but the throne of grace, the throne of grace, knowing that our offering is acceptable to God. And what is our offering? On what basis do we come with confidence? On what basis do we come with boldness? Because I'm good? Because I've done well this week? Because I've given a good offering and I've really served the Lord well? and I haven't gotten mad this week or said something I shouldn't have, is that how I can come boldly with confidence? No, I come boldly with confidence because the Lord Jesus Christ made a way. He made a way at Calvary. At Calvary, he made a way. And that's why we can boldly approach the throne of grace and there find help in time of need. That's why we don't have to live under a cloud of condemnation and a cloud of guilt. That's why the writer of Hebrews, writing to Jewish people, because Hebrews is written to Jewish people. But as Christians, we understand it as well, don't we? Because they understood all that law that they had lived under and that Jews, so many of them, who had not yet received the perfect sacrifice of Jesus, still were going back to an imperfect sacrifice. And so that's why the writer to Hebrews writes that. Everything that the devil, that sin, and our wrong choices stole from us, Jesus won back and made a way. Now, let's look for a little while at that day. And you say, well, are we, aren't we going to talk about Resurrection Sunday? We'll get there. But I want us to talk about that, that the crucifixion day, Good Friday, as we call it. And I've, I've, we've put together, go ahead and put up the next slide. And this puts it together. You'll read something a little bit different in all four Gospels. All four Gospels talk about um, the Good Friday. And this puts it all, here's God's timeline for that day. If you read an older translation, some things will say the sixth hour, the third hour, the ninth hour. And that can be a little bit confusing, isn't it? Um, but that's Roman time. So we have put it in our time. Okay? 
So we put it in our time. And let's look just a little bit uh, as we look at the day of his crucifixion. Then we'll go on in that. And I can tell right now we're only going to... We got it. We're going to get all the way through this because this is an Easter message. But there may be something a little bit different in the second service, depending on how, how depending on how things go. But look with me very quickly. Jesus was arrested in the night. We know we know about that. Um, they give an illegal trial. Uh, they uh, they hold an illegal trial in the night hours and in the early hours of the morning. Pilate condemns Jesus to death. The Jews cannot do that because they could not, could not give the death penalty under Roman rule. Okay, So Pilate, though he wants to release him, he lives in fear of people. And he condemns Jesus to death. And then it's very, very quick. Between 8 and 9, by 9, and we're going to just do a quick review and then we'll come into this a little more carefully. By 9, Jesus is crucified. Now when we say crucified, that doesn't mean he is dead yet. Being crucified is the act of being nailed to the cross and being hung on the cross. So he is crucified by nine. At noon, so he's hanging on the cross along with two others. By 12 noon, remember uh, if you've read it, this comes from all of the Gospels. By 12 noon, darkness covers the land and darkness covers the land for three hours. And then at 3 p.m., Jesus dies. Okay, not almost at nighttime, but at 3 p.m. And when we put all the scriptures together, it helps us to understand it a little bit better. So by three, by, at 3, Jesus dies, which is a miracle in itself that we'll talk about. What else happens when he dies? At 3, there is an earthquake. Um, as far as we know, then the, the light comes back, the sun, whatever happened. We don't know. Did you know that? Some people say, well, it was, a, it was an eclipse, but it was a full moon because it was the Passover. So it, it, was, it was supernatural. The light comes back. There's an earthquake. The curtain in the temple is torn. And that really mysterious thing, which we won't get, have time to talk about this morning, uh, tombs of godly people break open. They come back to life. And they walk into Jerusalem. Not some, and I'm not trying to make light, make light of it, but sometimes we read that and we think about our modern thing like Walking Dead or something like that. This terrible, seriously, this terrible thing from Hollywood, you know, like zombies and things like that. I, I really mean that. That's what we kind of, sometimes we read that and we kind of think that. And it's not that at all. Because these were tombs, these were godly people at that moment. And so rather than being a frightening, gruesome thing, it was a wonderful thing. It was a wonderful, faith-filled thing. And so that happens. And then between 3 and 6, because uh, the Sabbath is coming by 6, then between that time, Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate. He asks for the body. And before 6 o'clock, because by 6 o'clock, it's the Passover. And the Jews would not leave a dead body hanging on a tree. By 6 o'clock in the evening, Jesus, the body of Jesus has been wrapped in a cloth with some, with some spices put. And Joseph of Arimathea has put him in the tomb. And the stone has been rolled across by 6 o'clock already. So that gives us a very quickly an overview of the timeline. And so as we look at this, and I, uh, a little bit later, I've got a, if you want to later, I, I'll put a piece of paper with all of that. You can come up and, and look at it yourself if you want to after the service. So this gives us um, a very briefly an overview. And I want us to, we're going to move through this quickly, but that gives us the framework, okay? So here's the framework. There are all of these supernatural events that are happening. Here's the overview. In these 24 hours, within these 24 hours, there are over 25 specific Old Testament prophecies, specific Old Testament prophecies that are fulfilled in those 25 hours. There are miraculous things that happen. And I want us to look at what is happening, these miraculous things that are happening, not just on the hill, not just on Calvary, but in the temple in Jerusalem, about 300 meters away. In the temple, it was a busy day. Out on Calvary, Oh, the soldiers were there. Probably, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically, but I think we could assume that Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest and then the, the, the high priest behind the high priest and other members of the Sanhedrin that had convicted and condemned Jesus to death, you can bet, you can bet they were out there watching Jesus on the cross. You can, you can bet that. So that's out there. But it's a special day because it is Passover. 
And so in the temple itself, which is only about 300 meters away, other things are happening. And it was a busy day in the temple. It was always busy in the temple. The temple was the busiest place in Jerusalem, always, every day. But especially at Passover season, crowds of worshipers who were not out there on the hill looking at Jesus, this Galilean who had said he was the Messiah, but was now being crucified. Other crowds of worshipers were bringing their lamb, their own lamb, to be sacrificed at the temple. And that starts to tell us something, doesn't it, as we think about that. They thronged the courts. The priests that were on, the du on duty were that day were going about their various tasks. But it was a Passover festival. And so we look at what happens at 9 a.m. in the morning. Mark 15, 22 through 25. We're only going to read part of it. And they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offer him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. By the way, look at verse 23. Crucifixion was the most terrible, horrible death that someone could die. It had been, this type of death had really been arranged, had been put together by the Romans. It was an awful, awful death. And in the, the terror and the horror and the pain of crucifixion, there was only, there were this was one of the only mercies. And this was the mercy. The mercy was that as they were being crucified, or just before they were being crucified, they would give the person about to be crucified some wine with myrrh in it. Now, why did they do that? Because the wine and the myrrh mixed together was like a drug that would make the pain a little bit less, and that would make the suffering a little bit less. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to see something this morning. Jesus refused the wine mixed with myrrh that he might fully undergo the pain and the suffering and the price of sin for you and me. That's what he chose. He chose to fully and completely and wholeheartedly fulfill the will of the Father the reason for his coming to earth. That should speak to our hearts this morning when we find it hard at times to sacrifice, when we find it hard at times to say yes to Jesus. May this speak to us. Jesus chose to pay the full price, and he chose not to dull the experience and make it easier for himself. He chose the hardest road the full way for you and for me. Then the soldiers nailed him to the cross. And what does it say in verse 25? It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. So split with me, if you will, a split screen. It's nine in the morning as Jesus is crucified, nailed to the cross and put there. Nine in the morning on the hill outside the city. Within the city, in the temple, something else is happening at nine in the morning. It is the hour of prayer, and it's the hour of the morning sacrifice. And you know what that means? That means in the temple, a perfect lamb was brought to the priests, and they were slitting its throat and pouring its blood out and burning it on the altar for Sin. There were other types of offerings, but for sin, at nine in the morning. That's in the temple. And out on the hill, Jesus, the perfect lamb, was being crucified. Doesn't this make this day so much, so, so special to us, so meaningful to us? Jesus knew what he was doing. The priests in the temple, oh, they were going through the ritual. They had done it a thousand times. It likely meant very little to them. And it was only a symbol. But the reality was taking place on the hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull, at nine in the morning. He was the sin offering required by God. And then Jesus hangs on the cross for those hours until noon. And then we come to noon 
and noon was the time of the noon prayers at 12 noon. There was no sin offering at 12 noon, but it was the time of the prayers. And then let's read what happens at 12 noon. And brothers and sisters, I tell you, there's so much more here than this. I'm, I'm, I'm compressing so much of this wonderful story. And then we look at what happens next. It's in Luke, recorded in Luke, verse, chapter 23, verses 44 and 45. And by this time it was noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone. It is noon. And in the temple, pe people gather for prayer. And out on Calvary, on Golgotha, the one who said, I am the light of the world. At the time of day that should be the brightest, the one who was the light of the world has the condemnation and the judgment of God falling upon him for our sins. Look at John 8, 12. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But for you and me to have the light of life, Jesus had to have the punishment of our sin upon him and the darkness of punishment and judgment because darkness is associated with punishment and judgment in the word of God. The judgment of God for those three hours fell in a very real and tangible way upon Jesus, the light of the world, that you and I might have the light of life. And then, back in the temple, even in the darkness, the priests are continuing their duties. They go about their duties until three o'clock in the afternoon. And then, let us read what happens at three o'clock in the afternoon. And I've taken it from Matthew, from Luke and John, and part of Mark as well. You won't find this passage in any one place, but it's from all the places. And let me read it to you, and I want you to think about it. Put it all together. From noon until three, darkness came over all the land. And then about three, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? We know why he was forsaken, don't we? He had to be forsaken that you and I could be brought to God. He had to be forsaken that we could be received and that we could have audience with God. And then Jesus cried out, it is finished. Now you and I might say, yes, but he still has to be buried in the tomb. His body has to be wrapped up. He has to remain, his body has to remain three graves in the, three days in the grave, and then he will be resurrected, and then people will see him. Why does Jesus say, it is finished then? It's not really finished. In our minds, we, we think of it that way, don't we? We think of it really being finished when we come to resurrection, when we come to resurrection Sunday. But for Jesus, it was finished. Were, the, were those things yet still ahead? Yes, they were. But the work of Jesus in bringing you and me to God, in giving us an audience with, was, with God, was done at that point. At that point, Jesus had done, had fully completed the perfect will of the Father. He fully completed, and that's what it means. And he says, it is finished. And then he says, look at what he says. He does not say, why have you forsaken me? He now says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Because he'd paid the price and the price had been accepted, the price for sin. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he released his spirit. Now don't go over that too quickly. Let me ask you something. If you and I, if a mere mortal had gone through what Jesus had gone through, would you and I, hanging on the cross, have been, would we have had the energy and the strength and the ability to have cried out in a loud voice in any way? No. 
we would have been at the very, our lives would have been ebbing away. Here's the beautiful picture that we see right here. When it is written in scripture, he cried out in a loud voice, it is finished. What that meant, and then he gave up his spirit. What that meant was sinful men and the devil did not take his life from him. What it meant was Jesus gave his life. He gave his life to bring us to God. And with a loud voice, because he has done the will of God, he says, it is finished. And then he gave up his life. It says, as a ransom for many. And then what happens at that moment? Then we have verse, verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. May I say something to you this morning? Verse 51 is not as exciting as verse 52. Tombs split open and dead people, godly people, came forth and walked in Jerusalem. That sounds a lot more exciting, doesn't it? Let me tell you something this morning. Verse 51 is a whole lot more exciting than verse 52. Because when that happened and the curtain, that's the curtain in the Holy of Holies, when it was torn from top to bottom, God did that. God did that. And it was God himself that tore that curtain. And why is that exciting? And why does it mean something to you and to me this morning? Why does it mean so much to us on this Resurrection Sunday? Look at slide 10. Go ahead to slide 10. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Look with me. I know it's a little bit long, but let's at least read part of it. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. That is where God is. That helps us to understand it, doesn't it? There was the earthly, the holy of holies, the most holy place. And what do we read here? We can boldly enter the place where the high priest himself was scared to enter. Had a string, had a rope wrapped about his leg just in case he was struck dead because of sin. But the writer to Hebrews says, we can boldly enter. Does it mean because of the blood of Jesus? Do we have to push the curtain aside? No! By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain. Do you see that? Through the curtain. That is his flesh, his body, into the most holy place. That's what happened. That's why verse 51 is so much more wonderful and exciting than verse 52. When Jesus breathed his last, his body broken and torn, that was the real curtain. That curtain in the Holy of Holies, it was a symbol. It was a sign. It was potent. It was powerful. It was strong. But it was just a sign. It was just a symbol of the body of Jesus Christ himself that he gave, that was torn for you and me. And at 3 p.m. that afternoon, when he breathed his last, he gave up his life and he said, it is finished. God the Father echoed, yes, it is finished. And he tore the curtain, not from the ground up, not some priest saying, oh, I will do it now that Jesus is dead, but God himself tearing the curtain, tearing the curtain that you and I might have a way that what was lost in the beginning in the Garden of Eden could be restored, could be restored. Amen. 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 I want us to close with this. And Stephen, I want us to, we'll sing, we'll just even if it's just a chorus or, so, or something like that. I want to close with this, and it's not in the, there are no, you can read it on your own if you go back to the Old Testament. Let me tell you about the cloth, the, the, the curtain that was torn, that you and I might have a way back to God. Do you know what the color of the curtain was? If you've studied the tabernacle before, then you will know this, and it's a beautiful, beautiful picture. In the very beginning, when God just just keep your focus, that's okay. In the very beginning, and we can just sing with, with guitar, that's okay. In the very beginning, when God said, make the tabernacle, and I will dwell with my people, the curtain, every curtain, 
through the entrances, but specifically the curtain into the Holy of Holies was made with blue thread, was made with red thread, and was made with purple thread. And we close with this. You say, are you sure, Pastor Jennifer, that the, the curtain that was the body of Jesus, that was Jesus? Yes. Blue is the color of heaven, the skies, the heavenly man. But there had to be blood because a man had to die. And red was the earthly man. And blue and red together is purple because he was the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And the heavenly man and the earthly man and the king had his body torn and the curtain was open that you and I might have a way to God, a way to God. This is the resurrection message. This is the Easter message this morning. Amen? amen. Oh, amen, amen, amen. There's so much more there. I've given you, we've looked at just a little part. I'm going to ask you very quietly, Stephen, do you just have a, just, I'm, I'm going to ask you just to stand and, and no talking or chatting. Would you just begin to respond to the Lord as we close in prayer? And, and we'll, we'll sing something, but don't worry or wait for a song. Please don't wait for a song. In your own words, can you honor the Lord Jesus Christ, the heavenly man, the earthly man, the kingly one, who with his body tore the curtain that we would have a way to God? Hallelujah. 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 Would you thank him this morning and honor him and love him this morning for the way that he has made for you? <laughs>